Right, this is going to be another episode of Snake and Banter with me, Maui Snake here. We are joined by Moses, obviously fresh off the last CSGO major. Happy to, happy to be here at SMB. I've, I've been excited for this one, this invite to come into my DMs. There you go. It's, actually, what's mad is when I went back and looked, like you would think you would have been on this show more, but actually, bizarrely, we did like everyone else but you, it seems like. Right? <laughs> Somehow yeah. we missed you. We, would even, we were even no joke. I don't give a fuck if they're watching. Listen, you are what you are. We were even scraping the barrel like tier two analysts who like barely been on anything. Like, <laughs> hello, it's me, that guy that they barely know. But you know, so yeah, it's made one YouTube video one yeah. time. That's how we know you got too deep like in that. the fucking casting game, Moses. We forgot you're an analyst. I know. That's it's it's the it's the eternal curse. Like whenever I'm an analyst, people forget I'm a caster. Whenever I'm casting, people forget I'm an analyst, and it just it just goes back and forth in my life. Yes. Right, so obviously on Snake and Banter, we do the good, bad, the ugly approach. That's not some sort of sick references to the lineup that we've got right now. The point is, though, we always like Fight Club. Let the guests start first, Moses. So what is oh, your good shit. point? What good point are you bring to the table here? Oh, right out of the gate. I thought I was going to get some like warm up, a little bit of foreplay, no, a little no. bit of chit chat. No. Um, my good, uh, I I like the, the cutthroat challengers and legends stage at the major. I like the best of ones. I actually you sick really, bastard. This is your good point as well. <laughs> this is my good point. Okay. Oh, I, okay. my I fucking I fucking <laughs> okay. love that we have them. I like it when the favorite teams get put into holes by like an upset. I like when a style comes out that shocks them and takes a map okay. away. I think the map veto disadvantage for the favorite team is actually a really good disadvantage without being like super overpowered because at the end of the day in a best of one you're still getting to like a middling map. Like if you can't beat, you know, if you can't win that, then I mean, look, I don't know what to tell you. You should have a deeper map pool than most the other teams that you're going to be uh, the heavy favorites against. I think it's a nice change of pace from what we normally get when you look at like the, the partnered leagues at the moment. And I think that that whole partnered point is sometimes a little overblown. But if you look at how they work, Blast Groups is double a limb into a single limb knockout, which is three chances. And then that puts you into a showdown, with the, which is a fourth opportunity to qualify to the finals. Yes. I hate that many chances to qualify to the finals. If you look at Pro League, it's an A-team group. They have a high, a high part of the bracket, a mid-bracket in a low bracket, which is also insane, um, which is essentially double elimination with a last chance. So you get three opportunities to qualify through Pro League. Like, I, 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 it takes so long in these formats for games to mean something, for games to have consequences. I like when a favorite in the major loses an initial best of one and actually <coughs> has to battle back from it or loses two best of ones. And if you look at some of the most exciting storylines at the majors over what the past two runs, you had Liquid going 0-2, you had G2 trying to climb back after going 0-2, you had that phase Navi matchup at the elimination g2 at rio being put into a bad spot as well by the best of ones like these are all the points like these these are all the exciting parts of the challengers and legend stage and if we go through two weeks of challengers and legends being like yep everything's going according to plan all the favorites have won their best of threes everyone's just doing exactly as they should that's boring as fuck it's not a fun it's not fun to cast it's not fun uh for the viewers at home and i actually i actually fucking love the best of ones to start with <laughs> that's my good I like the format uh, he thinks this is hot take point mate this is what the fuck yeah, I know he's I know. coming in with that this is a good point alright fucking hell I know. thought he was going to start soft you know like I just love the majors they're good at this <laughs> come on then Maui okay yeah so so I would say that I it, w once the economy changed once we started having more gun rounds once it mm -hmm. felt like there were no hard resets then i actually started to like bo1s for a bit i think a prime example of when bo1s really just served their purpose uh was like 2021 katavits where they had the the play-in stage where everybody had bo1s and it was like eight opening round matchups and i think seven of them went the way of the favorites anyways and pretty convincingly and i actually just looked um to make sure and it was like the, i think one of the only ones was like a number 13 ranked team og beating a number 12th ranked team fanatic it's like okay that's that's you know you you would think that makes sense yeah. and i think that looking at that example looking at a lot of where bo1s lie or fall in terms of who's ending up the victor has actually shown that they actually are going to just choose the favorite most of the time because you are going to hit a middling map but i think you brought up a key point where i'm so against bo1s which is that Playing to Matt Vito's strengths is where tier one teams will come out on top in BO3s more often. They can punish pick. Sure. They can maybe be even second phase ban into a map where the, uh, you know, the underdog is going to have a little bit less likely of a chance. But I do think that it's up to the favorites to win those matches. But I also think like, like the way I would do it, the way I would do it in these situations is 
Challenger stage, I'm okay with still having BO1s in the opening round matchups. I think that's actually totally fine because you don't want to just run open qualifiers the whole way. BO3, 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 BO3. We don't have infinite time and they're all, there are just simply put like uh, limitations on what we can do in this tournament space to not just run a 45 day tournament best of five the entire way because we would actually get the best team probably winning that tournament very very frequently like 99 out of 100 times the best team going into it would win the tournament unless there's some weird power-up story if you ran bo5s from challengers all the way to the grand finals but i do think that once you hit legend stage you've more or less shown to the world you are of a certain caliber of team that you should probably just get tested on the deeper stages of playing top tier Counter-Strike, which to me is having a deeper map pool, which is having consistency, which is not just fluking your way through a BO1 format where you get two two easy wins or two random wins because you have this one little gimmick, uh, like say big on Inferno back at, uh, what was it, 28, or what, Krakow was it? or. Yeah. Was yeah, like either way, like they, you know, they just kind of got in because they were really good at they were one tricking their way into it. And I think that BO3s reduce that sort of variety, that it reduces um the likelihood that someone's just gonna just cheap their way in. And I I, so challenger stage, I like BO1s. Legend stage, get it out of here. Here's the thing, I can sort of see both angles in the sense that like if I do the broadcast angle and like the storylines in terms of like the most casual fan out there, obviously it is very exciting to even conceive that like Into the Breach could beat FaZe, but like weren't they the best team last year and didn't like win the Grand Slam recently? Like, that to a fan does in a fucked up sense give them like sort of a reason to watch a B or one at the major that they would never have normally. Like in theory, even an analyst, like not for the major, but if you do like a, a smaller event, Event. There's times where you don't watch every fucking group stage game, especially if you say, oh, the favourite just won 16-9. Like, whatever, I might skip that one. Let's see when they get tested later. That's exciting. I'll also say it is also... Like, you can add in an element which was, I'm not as big a subscriber of this, but it definitely puts pressure on favourites. It definitely means you can't, like, yeah. just fuck around and then be like, well, whatever, like, I'll be in the playoffs and then I'll start playing. It's like, well, guess what? G2 and Na'Vi, you never made it there. Like, actually, you needed to be dialed in from the first part of the tournament. My problem is just this. I could take be your ones in different setting. Like, my problem is I think there's a perfect storm. I'll probably do a separate video on this one day, so I'll make it quick. Basically, it's these three things combined. It's be your ones which I agree with, Maui. Technically, it's not as big a deal anymore. Plus the seeding, which is just whack, because at the moment it's not really seeding. It's like something weird based on like previous tournaments, like an RMR. And even then you're in different regions. So people know the example Richard gave, that Heroic did everything right. They were number one ranked team in the world. They won 3-0 on the RMR, but they somehow got the fifth seed where they got in like the legend stage. Like, what? Because they did some weird thing with the regions and like they didn't want to again because they didn't want to discriminate. They didn't want to even pretend like... Can we really know if Oceanic region is better than Europe? So, yes, we can. Like, sorry, every analyst in the world knows that. Every team knows that. Like, certain things we cannot. And then the third one is that you also play two bo ones on the first day. So you've also added to the variance. Because I tell you what, every day reset you give, this is why actually in a fucked up way they didn't play the best opponents. I can give credit to Gamer Legion that they were actually at their best on like the last couple of days of the major because they had to go through the whole major. Like the problem I have with the BO1s as well is you can be 0-2 after one day and you can be 2-0. Yeah. So you add in the bad CD elements. So then you have like, for example, we all know the ones that we really complain about isn't actually against favorite skies. Like even though I don't like BO1s, Into the Breach beat the shit out of phase for most of that game. Game and did the same to Ents. In a sense, as long as I make it be on the format, they deserve that win. My problem is when you have the ones where it's like there's been a bunch of these majors where like there's sort of a weird seeding for the first B or one. They both there's they win, but another underdog wins. Maybe one gets an upset, and then the two play each other in the two zero. And it's like, bro, by the time we get to the best of threes, it's like, how have you like not lost a tournament life? Meanwhile, this has happened to G two and Faze at a couple of majors. They've had a couple of majors where they played like top five teams in the two B ones on day one that's the only problem i have again that's like the format problem you notice i'm never blaming the fucking underdog team the underdog team beat the ass of the other team and if the favorite lost the game on some level yeah that is your fault you can't just go with the format like you played badly on the first map and that's sorry so i'm with you on that one i think it certainly is exciting i would change a lot of things about the format obviously yeah there's i think there's plenty to but i think the points you make about like seeding is is a huge one obviously and the two bo ones on a day i think the bo one is like the magnet at the moment that takes the brunt of it is. all the fucking issues yeah. while there's there's other ones where if they're solved the bo ones wouldn't feel yeah. as bad 
Because I actually think Maui's point about the economy is true. Like, in the modern day, this isn't like the hard reset meta where me and Moses used to do the Swiss be your pure be your ones on, with random... Yeah. Yeah. Dude, yeah, essentially, if you just, like, actually, like, win a 1v1 and then they, like, sort of, like, fuck up a smoke, that's, like, the half one. Like, there's crazy shit like that could happen. So we're not in that world anymore. And I'll even say in the modern day, I actually think the other thing that's probably evened up be your ones if you're, if you're a favourite is if you have the better players and aimers, mate... Buying MP9s on CT side is incredibly effective right now. You aren't just saving for the pure fucking uh, M4 and you don't have to go on the shit farm. I think that there's plenty of teams make those half buys work. Like You really do have to actually get outplayed to lose the BO1. I actually, Come on. I actually think MP9s are better than Famas right now. Sometimes they are, mate. <laughs> yeah, especially the range. Yeah, I, whenever I see someone in a duel with a Famas, I'm like, oh, baby, you're, you're playing hard mode. Mate, it's when they I'm actually try to full auto spray it. I'm like, <laughs> Someone fucking take him outside and explain what this gun is about. Like, you're just doing essentially the worst spraying weapon in the universe against like real exactly. rifles. And all right, you can do that. Okay, Maui, what's your good point? Yeah, mine is the still the fact that we're keeping the open circuit nature for the major championship i think is one of the most romantic and beautiful parts of csgo competitively where we have these underdog stories and we already just touched on the seating we already touched on the format that maybe could have helped uh un or the favorite teams the partner teams make it through but because there's this giant chasm between partner teams and tier two teams in terms of the environment that they're both experiencing the ecosystem that they're a part of the tier two teams are just slogging it through ccts whatever the equivalent of like home sweet home you know all their real re yeah, yeah. regional tournaments and everything like that and we don't necessarily know if the style that they're playing is consistent or it's actually even feasible or reliable versus tier one teams but the open circuit has once again shown us that there's a lot of ta talent and teamwork and tactics that are brewing in that space that deserve just all us paying mind to them because they're actually just finding victories in bo3s versus the best teams in the world and it isn't as simple as just looking at name value and brand name of orgs and players and saying that gamer legion has no chance I, I i think that i'm not trying to necessarily sell the underdog stories of the major i'm just trying to say that the way that the circuit is structured for <clears throat> the major itself it kind of actually makes you believe in that story like i think a lot of people probably believe this when they first were watching the olympics when they were 12 years old they're seeing some runner and they're like why isn't there got some guy in kenya that's just faster than all these people and we're actually kind of finding out in some ways there are there are a couple players out there like cypher from into the breach that actually just may more or less just made a name entirely for himself yeah. off of that singular event and maybe he's not going to go on to have this crazy history but in that moment he was the best t-side ramp player on vertigo yeah. at the entire event and that's undisputable and so for those people to have their moments of glory gives them something for in in all not even just the legacy of them as players but for their lives that they can just hitch themselves on and that they can more or less grasp to because they kind of had that moment of glory and i just think that overall the fact that the major doesn't have any kind of process that's more or less uh you know outs the the part like D d differentiates between partner teams versus tier two teams it's simply the same rmr it's the same qualification system for everybody and everybody has an equal chance to me i i am very happy that that's still in place because it's sh it shows that it's still valuable because at a glance value you'd say why are we even doing this why are why are we even giving these underdogs a chance because they're not going to win anyways but we've been proven wrong if that was an argument you were going to make yeah, I, I actually, I agree. I mean, I think there's a couple other angles you can even take with it as well to like build that romanticism. I mean, you mentioned Cypher, but I mean, even look at a guy like Ema, look at a guy like uh, JL, look at, uh, you know, look at some of those players that popped up off these teams that sure. how long would it have taken for those names to become noticed to the degree that they are now? I mean, if you're not playing in tournaments, you have no chance of getting recognized as someone that could be a potential benefit to one of the other pro teams. You have no chance of moving up the ladder. So that open circuit allowed them <coughs> a stage to blow up. And now that's going to be names that 
we're looking for to get poached by some of the top teams. And even if you want to go a little bit more romantic with it, and this will probably appeal to Duncan and I most of all, considering we're old school guys, but some of these teams like into the breach, even bad news Eagles, like coming out of nowhere, like just making a team and going to the majors. That's like, that's like old school esports where you're that's not part of an org. Yeah. Like that is exactly what esports was created on 20 years ago is those kinds of stories. I mean, you did it yourself in your teams. career, Moses, when you first started, yeah. right? No one knew you guys to that degree, right? No, we had to play at lands regionally in like Michigan and Ohio and Illinois before we got recognized nationally. And then you go to lands in, in LA and then you go to New York and then all of a sudden you're at the CPLs, which were our majors. So, I mean, it's the same kind of rise that everyone over the years has had to go go on. And obviously that kind of disappeared or faded into the background a little bit at some point, but having those stories rising up through the majors is, is wonderful. And I think um, a lot of the old school guys probably had like some kind of emotional connection. I know I know a lot of the talent did for sure. Um, watching those teams do good and i mean look at the opportunities too like bad news eagles they don't play in tournaments outside the major like they actually even struggle to qualify for the big yep. tournaments outside of the majors but still twice a year they get to go to the major they get to sit at home and play counter-strike online and then they attend the major and they make hundreds of thousands of dollars in sticker money so even for them like it's it's, it's such a cool moment for for players that are that have that don't have the opportunity to join an org from their their country or their region um and and like just just still get to kind of have that success and still get to find ways to live their dream yeah the joke is because remember that the famous like magics or whatever fucking line where it's like when you're online and you're good it's like they're drinking the favorite brand of coke in the chair yeah. or whatever and they, are, they must have the opposite essentially the only thing that will sustain bad news eagles is like the tears of fucking phase players after lost maps or something like <laughs> and it only lasts like you know a few months at a time they have to save it like it's like bottled up like there's only a little bit left it's the major again right fucked them up and it's become like like mate the, the one on that team that's the most ridiculous one people know juan flatro and gxx frag they're actually skilled players is. That synopsy oh, yeah. guy, when he goes to the major, it's like, as fucking my mate Flusher hooked you up. How are you doing this? <laughs> You're just reading where they are on the map all the time. If you were doing this in normal game, surely your team would be really good. Like, it's only against FaZe, though. Like, against FaZe, he's just, like, in the Matrix, reading the code. Like, oh, that's where they are. Like, it's ridiculous, mate. It's ridiculous. So. They, don't, they don't get out of bed if it's not FaZe. <laughs> no, the apparently. Like, they just, they and the just joke is, lose. even if they beat them, they're like, right, you know what? Fuck it. We aren't really meant to be in the playoffs anyway. Let's just knock off home. Whoever you are, have the win. Take it. It was phases anyway. Fuck phase. Like, I know it's like some personal vendetta in it. Like, whatever. So here's the thing I will say. The reason why I do think you must have some open component to qualification is actually part of the things you're saying, but I'll take it even further. I can tell you in League of Legends, when they first had like the LCS, it had like European Soccer League's promotion and relegation. And you really could, by the way, have a good team and fail the promotion match and be relegated. And in theory nobody's could actually win the promotion match and beat you and be in the LCS. And what I can tell you that did, even though, look, obviously you can imagine why all the big orgs went against it. Like, what, we spent all that money on the roster? Or, you know, it was one bad day. There was a lot of good reasons to take it away. But the best reason they should have kept it is it meant that you could never ignore a player you didn't like or you thought had a bad attitude or you'd heard some rumours about. And so as a result, as in a T, tier one couldn't just say, you're blackballed, you never get to play. Because what could happen is he could just rock up with his semi-pro team and just beat your ass in the server and suddenly it's like oh but we said he was talking when you didn't have that when they made lec and they made it a franchise league and you have to essentially be chosen by the gm of an lec team to come and join their team you can actually just keep people out essentially the example i would give would be look this is probably ridiculous because he's so insane someone would have taken a gamble but if you think about those early simple stories if he was even like 10 percent worse and it was like the lec i'm talking about now you'd just never even get to be in the teams you wouldn't be able to force your way through in flip side or when he was on that dog shit that one lad he played for that like worst players with his mates and we're still like fragging out like VP and shit like essentially what you're able to do if you have the chance like this like the Immer guy is a great example no one really knew him before this tournament he was just like a whatever player like no one put the spotlight on him he put the spotlight on himself at this major like after this major everyone's gonna be like holy shit so no I agree that aspect's good my problem again is just the way you do it like for example when I look at like the RMR system I wish they could like in integrate like some semi daughter elements like I don't want it to be the whole circuit but like if for example you win like a big tier one land just before the RMRs. Can't you have a spot 
even if you hadn't been like legends at the last major, do you really have to play online against a bunch of dodgy ones? Because the problem with the online qualifiers still, because of the online nature is, one, there are literally cheaters in all the open qualifiers still. That is still a thing. And then two, you just get the worst version of the upset story, which is someone just beats you in round five of the bracket. And then they just get bombed out and don't even go to the RMR. So that one just sucks. So the other thing I had an idea for was, Look, this is going to sound like the fucking wet dream of fucking Ulrich Schultz, which is definitely not why I'm setting it up. But I even believe we could make an incentive in the actual real circuit to do this. So, you know, they had before this major, they had that ESL uh, Melbourne where Bad News Eagles lost in the final to Movistar Riders. Obviously, with the Martinez and the guy now instead of Sun Pius, right? I would actually even like it if there was a world where for like a tier two tournament like that, you have a LAN and it's like if you win the LAN like Movistar Riders, you get a spot to the RMR. So there we go. Now, if you're the underdogs, you can also try and qualify for a smaller land, win it, and you get, like, the last spot at the RMR or something like that. That would even be cool, because then you did it on land, mate. Like, you didn't just come through some weird online qualifier and get lucky or play the good team after they played 3B or whatever. I can't remember what the format is now, but shite. It's absolute garbage if you go and look. Like, everyone who's making fun of us, Charles, like, they're not getting through these... Were the teams that are beating them getting through? Were they at the majors? Did we all see them doing well? That was just, that, I, like I've always said, that's bird strike, mate. You're throwing enough noobs, eventually one of them goes in the engine, the bird <laughs> dies, and the fucking plane goes down. Like, no one wins that one. That's just a travesty all around. So, yeah, as usual, I found the negative in both your good points there. So <laughs> Yeah, that's it's perfect. I have, I have a question on one thing you just said, though. Because I think, I mean, I think it, I, I agree there's there's some good, there's a good angle to take where like go to like an ESL Challenger Melbourne and give that like a spot to the RMR. But at what point would that become almost like be counterproductive to an open circuit if you, you know, if you, let's just say hypothetically Valve gives all of, all of ESL's ESL Challenger events, you know, an RMR spot to the winner, but Blast doesn't have those kinds of events, right? So then doesn't that kind of close off the circuit and like make more importance out of the ESL events? I mean, I don't really... I think that horse has already bolted out of the fucking... <laughs> the, the barn, and that train has already gone through the station, and that ship has I, sailed. No, but, I, yeah, I, I understand yeah. the premise you say about abstract. I will just say, by the way, in general, though, I actually can just fold it back into... I wouldn't have a problem with any upsets at all if we just didn't have the regional RMR go to the major. If it just went to that land qualifier again, and you go to the land qualifier, by the way, and you're into the breach, and you just crack heads against all the teams... By the way, I'll even say the, the fucking dreaded greyhound. If you can go to the land qualifier and beat out OG and fucking Game Legion that you get to the major God bless you I, I'm not going to complain but if you just come out of the Oceanic region and I'm like who is even in that region like isn't it like two and a, one and a half teams or something like what's going on that's my problem Is it's not really about the, the idea that we have an open circuit I actually think by the way like I said fundamentally it is good it's actually one of the rare things about Counter-Strike is because we're not just real franchise leagues I mean even ESL tournaments and even Blast gives you the fucking showdown we at least keep some open component because that's how he says. What if there really was? There hasn't actually been one I can think of in CS history. What if there really was actually like the sixth best team in the world doesn't play in the whole circuit? What if they, that was the way they could get in? That would be cool. Well, also, I mean, Duncan, you'd, you'd know this better than I think both of us, but if you don't have any element of an open circuit into the eSport, then what you have to do is develop like the, the development league or the semi you got to do league, something, yeah. Which League of Legends has tried to do and failed. Yep. Uh, Overwatch has tried to do and failed. Counter-Strike did re relatively successfully, but that's because we still have kind of a thriving, like, you know, small event for like the tier yep. two teams outside of our tier one events. But like, you know, it, you have to have one or the other. And it's so hard to get eyeballs to warrant the cost of a semi-pro league. So if you don't have an open circuit... All of a sudden, you have this product and this this structure that really isn't nearly as effective as you'd like it to be. Yes. This actually leads into my good point, essentially, because it is along these lines. It's just the arrival of Emma, the guy from Gamer Legion, who was basically like, if people don't know, just go watch. I'm telling you, if you watch the whole tournament he played, if he hadn't have just had his worst half in the last half of the tournament, I think it, people would have given him the MVP. I think even people who are Zewu fans would admit that the stats look bonkers because they're so good, they're bad games. The GOATs can still look statistically insane. Even people who watch him know he had some dodgy halves. He had some games where he didn't always carry or someone else did as well. The Emma guy would have been the MVP and it would have been the craziest story of all time because I was watching some of his POV demos and the ridiculous thing is, it's not what you'd think. He's not like when I first saw Kay Serato and I was like, how did someone with him like that not already get into tier one? Like, the fuck? He's actually already better than like fucking Fur and Fall and all these guys. Like, what? How is he? This guy, when you watch it, right, if it wasn't for the fact the stats are bonkers, you would just think like, oh, it's just a good Tier, he's just a tier one player. Mate, he's just one of those players where his aim is just super consistent. Like, if he locks on you and starts firing, he doesn't go straight to your head. But if you don't headshot him, he will get the kill. 
every single time. Like, you can go watch all these Mirage tie-offs. They're mental. He's always in the right position. He positions himself well. He doesn't go aggro pushes, by the way, even though he's an entry player. He, like, he, dude, he plays... The joke is, if you take the name tag off, the aim's worse, but the way he positions is like an eco. He takes the swings the same way, like, really consistent, always has the crosshair in the right position. The craziest thing I say is it's not even just popping heads. It's just getting kills. And I've always thought in some ways that's actually more pure Counter-Strike because the guy who can just get the headshot, you can get lucky, you can be streaky, you can just do all sorts of bullshit. If you actually just carve people up with an AK and just body shots all day long, mate, that's actually in some ways, like, you, you are destined to be a, a real tier one pro. Like, that that can last a long time in this game. So I actually thought he was one where even though, listen, the numbers might not be replicable because those were numbers like any star player would dream of at a major. Insane, but I do actually. think like this, I, that's the player for me I can easily look at and say, I think he could have a real future, mate. You put him on a better team especially, that would be someone I'd be looking at as a real prospect. You know, some of the other big names, they had either a series bad or they had... There was reasons why you could, like, for example, the Boris guy had crazy stats, but he looked at his brain for the game. It was a bit off. He didn't. He looked like actually, if you put him against tier one pros consistently, he wouldn't he wouldn't have the same result. I can see why he banged on tier one, tier two rather online. So I thought the Immer guy was like, this is one of those ones where like this is a cool fucking underdog story. Like this guy took a team. Again, also not even a team with all veterans and shit. He just went straight to the major final. Like, what a fucking sick... It actually reminded me, even though no one's going to know the reference, Moses, and this was a one-hit wonder. Back in the day when that Jack Swanee crew had that Zid guy who just went mental at that one CPL. Dude, people don't know. He was like another almost MVP of the event. And it was like, again, he didn't do it beyond that. So I hope the Immer guy does. I think he maybe has a better style. But when that happens every now and then, like that, that moment sticks in history. It really does. Dude, he's With, gonna have a he's gonna have a big decision to make that Emma. He's gonna get yeah. some offers and he's gonna have to make a call if he thinks that Game Religion can replicate that success and keep going and he wants to stick around for it, or if he's gonna bail out and go for the higher likelihood of having that kind of success. He's got a tough fucking decision to make after this major. If he does though, just hit me up on the line. Like I'll 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 stay right clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be like I'll tell him the same thing I used to tell Shocks back in the day. Look, you can be friends with Smiths after the event. You can invite him round, watch the fucking finals demos together, but you have to play with him <laughs> you know you're not being a dick if anything take take the money you win by not playing with him buy him a steak dinner when you get back just go there you go i love yeah. you mate yeah, yeah. cool nice bottle of wine with with emma with emma what's what it was impressive to me when i was looking at his demos during the major was that yeah he was fairly aggressive but he wasn't just balls to the walls aggro like a boros where boros was just Boros was sometimes just pushing smokes and sometimes just killing people, just headshotting them as soon as he came out. Most of Ima's kills felt like they were set up in some substantial way. Uh, like, to me, he kind of... He was a little bit more aggressive than this, but I would have actually compared him most to Hunter, where it felt like he was... Like, Hunter is really good at reacting in the mid-round and playing off of the contact that's made, but it's almost like if you if you gave Hunter a little bit of edge in the early round, you kind of have Ema, because Ema was really good at reacting, and he had that first kill potential also. Like, like Gamer Legion would sometimes set Ema up with, like, a boost or, like, just a flash play or something like that, and he would go for that kill, and... Yeah, he's not one bulleting people. He's like four bulleting people a lot of the time, which is cool. And so he, it's like he's playing within a structure, and it's almost kind of like it, it's weird because I, 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 when you say where would he go, what offers is he going to have to turn down? It's hard for me to look at too many teams in say the top fifteen, and I'm like, that's a great match for him, or that's a huge upgrade for the team. I guess Fnatic would be the most obvious choice. Where honestly, you could probably slot him in for. Fasher relatively easily. Uh, I think Roy kind of, I don't, I don't know if Roy has a lot more to give, but like that, that wouldn't be a horrible shout as an individual. Uh, but like, I, I think what's, what's still impressive is that even on the big stages when he started badly, which he did in a couple of the games, like the first map he played against heroic, he recovered. And so many times when you see even his teammate Kios, for example, have a bad start on a map on land, they just fall off the face of the earth. Oh, they're never sure. to be seen for the rest of the game. And they're just in their own head. And Ima showed to me that he had at least a level of mental composure that even if he misses a couple sprays early on or whatever, he's going to create enough opportunities for himself, whether that's with the structure or how he re-aggresses in the mid round, late round, that he's going to just carve out those opportunities for himself that he's going to find success. Like it's not even about just hitting the shot every single time, which is why when Boros lost to Gamer Legion second map and he drops, what is it? Five kills or something just oh, on Like it was, it was, yeah, it was terrible because he just missed everything and just kept throwing his life at his opponents. He just kept throwing 
throwing himself, throwing himself, throwing himself, and just saying aim duel after aim duel after aim duel. It reminds me of this old, like, steel video he made on YouTube maybe, like, eight years ago that was yeah. like, if you're taking aim duels and you're losing them, stop taking them. And Boros obviously never watched that video, nor did he internalize that message. Yes. By the way, if people know, that wasn't like a fucking stupid comment Steel said. His point essentially was if you're playing matchmaking, you want to improve. Don't just take like crazy aim duels all day long. Essentially, like learn positioning, like timings, like fucking flash usage, etc. Make the kills easier. I agree, by the way. That's a great comparison even because the Boros guy, he really did just run over people with aim and when it didn't work, he just got his ass torn up. It was sad. Like, what was it? Do you have any... Actually, let's go to your bad point then. Go to... What's your bad point? Yeah, we touched on this a little bit earlier. My bad one is just the, the RMR format and disorganization and how much of a straight-up train wreck it was. And I don't even mean, like, the event with all the issues they had. Uh, Duncan, you brought back, bring back the, the RMR that feeds into, like, a global qualifier yep. before the major <clears throat> begins, which which I which I have as a point, and that, that would be obviously a great improvement. But, I mean, Maui, you know this from when we got to Mexico. I didn't even realize it before I got to Mexico for the America's RMR. The America's teams only had two two chant like, two losses, and they were out. Yeah. It wasn't like the Swiss system in Europe or in oh, Yes. the Asia Oceanic, yeah. where they had three chances. It was the Swiss system with only two chances. This is like a built-in feature of the system that is just automatically <laughs> yeah. broken. And obviously part of it is because the Americas region lost a legend spot. So they took a spot away from the Americas due to bad performance at the pre previous Wasn't major. there also a thing where it's like you could actually go 3-2 but still not qualify? Or was that, or was that the last major? There was one hour was the last one. They did that. The Some, someone went 3-2 and still didn't qualify. Like, what? That, yep. That's the whole point of the Swiss. But yeah, you're right, actually. <laughs> like that, that, that change of format for the Americas is obvious. Like, I don't know how that went under the radar, like so smoothly. And I, th I have to think like, not this whole, like, you know, is it because we are Brazil? It's just, is it because we are the Americas? Like it doesn't get that same, like if that happened to Europe, man, if they had oh, that kind of a disadvantage, of it would be a fucking explosion. But there's the Americas one, but then even over in the European one, not only did the Americas have two chances, but some European teams got four chances. You guys had the play in stage which is just like a, a crazy feature outside of the Swiss where there's actually an extra play in for one more team. And again, I know it's because of the change because of the legend spot taken sure. away, but we should not be having an RMR system where that, that feature is even, that shouldn't even be a possibility. There has to be a better way to organize it. Considering the fact that like, we want to have all regions, you know, included in the major considering we want to have a level playing field across the regions. That's the whole goal of this. But then you look at it and you're like, Oh, the America's RMR was a different format than EU and Asia. The EU RMR was different than the other other two RMRs and the Asian RMR was different than the like all three RMRs had a different format to them which is such a mental concept for the world championship of Counter-Strike and that whole RMR system it just needs like some kind of an overhaul to for that to not occur like that's such a crazy thing to have happen yeah, I bad. mean the the fact that like Asia has a double <laughs> bracket as opposed to a Swiss system it's so bad in it it's so strange um I I, I would say that the the thing with the America's spot or America's losing a spot because of their past performance, in theory, I actually kind of like that concept. So I'm not really against it. And I know that there have to be some con concessions made in terms of format just so that you can adhere to the fact that America, frankly, didn't look like they deserved another spot. Like, frankly, yeah. take another spot away. Fluxo did not deserve to be there. Like, you could have four America spots, and I've been fine with it based off of the quality of play. If you had Cloud9 there instead of Fluxo, this major would have been actually just better, objectively, in terms of co competitive, yep. in, in terms of how competitive it was. So, uh, yeah, with the, yeah, with the I, four formats, or what? Yeah. No, I mean, I'm with you. I like the idea of a punishment if a region is that bad at a major. But, like, if the punishment is going to literally destroy the format that you're supposed to play and you can't even run it properly what are we doing? Like, there's yes. got to be a better way to do it. So yeah, I don't know if the answer is taking two away so that it cleans it up so that you can run the format. That seems a bit extreme in my mind, but like, I get it. Like, I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but like, we've we, like the fact that that's so, just built a built in way that the RMRs work is, <clears throat> is just mind blowing to me. One, one solution that I would have out the gate is just that I, I think we should be inviting the eight teams that make it to playoffs to the next major. I think that was something that was scrapped because of the COVID era and we wanted to run this RMR system and they didn't reinstate it. I think the logic was it had been too long by the time you'd have yes. the major from before some shit, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. It was that, you know, two, two years be between majors or whatever, year and a half. Does merited some kind of more arduous, more testing process so that people would have to go through that rigor to qualify. But now we know if, if a team, you know, stuff changes very quickly in esports and CSGO for that matter. A team can get much better and much worse in a five-month, six-month period, but a team that was top eight a major 
still in my eyes deserves it almost every single time the fact that outsiders didn't have a chance to defend their crown at this major that's yeah. that's just that's just bad planning that's just that's just some that's using an outdated format and idea that still to me holds no relevance because even though they made a player change and they didn't make it with chiron because they blew up that was just because they were under such crazy pressure because their aspirations were so much deeper than just qualifying to the major so i would change i would change that and we'll, i would say start from there and see if that alleviates <coughs> some of the problems with having differences in rmr qualifications and here's the thing. On the one hand, there's two ways you can go with this. Either you just do, like, like here's the problem. At the moment, we are almost saying, like, the regions, technically, could all just be equal. Like, you know, just qualify for your spots. If that's true, then every region should have the same qualification method. Like, by definition, you're saying you're not differentiating. So, like, if you do that, it doesn't really make sense to do it. But also, if we're going to give slots like this, which is the opposite of that thinking you'll notice, which is why the seeding angle makes no sense. If we're going to give slots away and one region gets more, like, obviously, Europe gets loads because it's Europe and CIS, remember? We combined them together. And that's, a, let's be real, it's just, a, it's just become a European game. That's the way it is right now. If we're going to do that then it also in my opinion doesn't make any sense to have this approach where it's like um let me think what was i going with that the, it, then again oh sorry if you go, yeah if you're gonna if you're gonna make it so that one region has way more slots then actually maybe they all should have different formats but they'd have to have ones that work like moses right you can't run a swiss system if you don't take the top eight teams I mean, people might not know this, but actually ESL did this famously at that New York event in 2016. They ran a Swiss system with something like eight teams in it to start with. And it meant that they had to violate every rule. Like Fnac played Optic twice or something. Even though one rule was you can't play the same time. And it just like, they didn't make any sense because it's like you ran a format that doesn't actually work. Like you have to have certain conditions to meet a Swiss system with the normal rules. So the other thing I would say as well, it's just that you guys made a pretty good like real points there. I just have a comedic point, which is even though I love FaZe Clan, this is why them having that thing of like, but wait, I know they went 2-3 and they lost all those BO3s, but there's more. They get to play in a last chance qualifier, and if they win that, they go to the major, then they fuck around, bullshit their way through, get past Na'Vi, get back, you know, and then suddenly, like, how are they in, in the playoffs? Like, this is mental. But I will say this, the joke part goes like this. This is like I got to do my version of what Carmack used to do in Pro League, where somehow, magically, he obviously just wanted fucking the polls of Virtus Pro to be in, didn't he? So, like, every time they would fuck up Pro League, it was like, but wait, it's not just relegation this season. There's a last chance qualifier qualifier then like they got in again then the next season they fucked it up and it's like well they did fuck it up but you know what we've expanded pro league by two slots welcome back voters pro it's like it's like you let me design it as a phase stand like no no but wait there should be like a last chance way for them to play to prove that they still should get in though and then at the end like i'm just like and the majors just been expanded to 26 teams now welcome to <laughs> phase clan and cloud nine you're gonna get there no matter what because i agree it's like mate how are, it's a bit like the pro league corner the blast one it's like I'll, I want the really sturdy format. And then if you lose, you lose. It's not like, right, you have five chances to get in. Like, eventually, if you, keep, if you keep increasing the numbers, guys, the good teams can't lose, can they? Like, they actually, at that point in time, they, they, if, we just, if we just say, like, your whole career, it's like, well, they're just better players, aren't they? So eventually, they're going to get the slot. Like, we're actually going against the spirit of competition there. Like, why should the underdog have to win, like, four times or something? Like, that seems a bit out of bounds. So, yeah, I'm with you on all that one. I think you've all nailed that one. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Right, Maui, your good point. Yeah. Bad point, rather. Bad point. Yeah, my mine is mine. My bad is that it's it kind of is two parts on this one, but the main point of it is where Simple's career ended for me in, in the majors, obviously in the majors. Yeah, yeah, for the major. Obviously, obviously there's still a couple still a few more tournaments, tournaments that, yeah. that are coming up, and, and things can change. Like, narratives could slightly change, but I think narratives are the most, or majors, that is, are the most driving force in narratives sure, when yeah. we're talking about it as pundits, is that with, with Simple now having, what's it, 21 MVPs, the single major, the single major MVP, I was talking, I kind of made it as like a hot take earlier this year that, you know, if, if Device came in to play, if Astralis played well, if they won a major or two majors this year, if Device won a bunch of MVPs, then Simple's GOAT title would have been up for question, uh, for contention, that is. Well, now there's Zaiwu that's knocking on his door with 15 of his own MVPs, a major win, a major MVP by, well, quite a... Quite, by quite a sizable margin he was the best player on this major winning team but also everybody just farmed on his roster so i wouldn't necessarily i'm not holding that against him and i'm not also holding him to some ridiculous standard there but with just with simple and i would say just 
making the goat conversation more manageable because if you if someone asks about CS:GO I would say that even the most average fan would still say today that Simple is the all-time greatest player but the conversation is just so much more open that it just leaves you doubting a little bit more and I would say that if you really wanted to pick apart the career and the history between Zaiwu and Simple there's there to me there's a case there's a case that Zaiwu could over could actually take it because of his standing and his finishes on the HLTV top 20 in terms of his finishes in terms of what he was able to accomplish in those years where he was by far the best player for the first couple years on Vitality. I'm still of the side that Simple is the greatest, for sure, but I wouldn't think that it's a discussion that's worthless, whereas before, I would have been pretty against it, and now I just think, like, now now you just have to second-guess a little bit of the greatness of Simple and how much th that, that distance he had from the number two was so vast before, but now it's closed to a gap that it almost is like if... Let's say Vitality win. Let's say, let's say, because we don't know obviously when CS2 the switch is going to be made here. Let's say they win the when they win Dallas. I don't know if they're playing Dallas. Let's say if they win the fall final or the spring finals. Let's say they win Cologne. Let's say it's on CS, uh, you know, CS Go still. The conversation is so open there that what's bad to me is that Simple's title is up for question, and to me, he has no chance of retaining it. Like the way that he played at the major was very good, but it's not even it like Zywu is a tier above him uh, for this year for me. Pretty yeah, spicy there, Moses. <laughs> yeah, well, I think Zywu is definitely better this <clears throat> year. I think here, I don't think it's look. I think if you wanna if you wanna talk about Counter Strike as a whole, maybe it's different. But if you talk about CS:GO, I actually I actually don't even think it's a close conversation between Simple and Zywu. Or Simple's Simple's the greatest uh, and can't even be touched. And I think there's I think there's two two main factors to me for it. I think one is simply the longevity of Zywu's career. Like he just didn't have enough years in his CS:GO to match up against the years that Simple has played and, and been the greatest uh, across that time span. There's just no way. And the second one is like I think I think you laid it out pretty well. If you if you put like the numbers next to each other and just read down the stats line of a major 15 MVPs. Yeah, that can contend with the 21 MVPs and the one major of Simple, but you know, you, you miss the kind of eye test factor of, of how many years Simple was just a fucking hard carry for all of his teams. <clears throat> like the, all those all those trash Navi rosters that he had to just kind of, you know, carry limping into grand finals. Um, the flip side, the liquid of where he was just like a, a one man wrecking crew, just getting them deep into tournaments as well. I think when you add in the eye test and just like stop looking at purely the stats, I don't, I don't even think it's close but I, in my mind it's the lack of longevity to Zaiwu's career that he can't be in that argument and it's not even a slight on Zaiwu. I just think his career just started what like really kicked off in like 2019-ish yeah. 2020 yeah, yeah. where you're just like okay well Simple's got like five years on you like what are you like what are you really supposed to do like you just don't have the longevity to stack up I do think Maui's wild on this one. He should have actually saved this for hot take point. Mate. This was more of a hot take one. Because here's the thing. I think you just preserved the moment on this one, Maui. Because the problem is, it's like I, I have to both... Now, it's always me who has to fucking do this. Now I have to just shit on Zebu again. So that everyone thinks I don't even think he's good. Because you all just be saying he's the fucking goat. Like, if no, you give me a fucking... Obviously not, give me a break. Clearly. Give me a break to actually celebrate this motherfucker. <laughs> but instead, all right, you know what? If someone has to do it... I'll do it then. So first of all, when he says that line, he goes 15, every, six of them were online, right? Simple won three online, device won like four or something. We can just take off all the online MVPs, make it just LAN, and spoiler, it's not close. Like, it's actually device that's closer, if anything. So Simple just did it the real way, mate. Six online MVPs, fuck right off. That was the shittest era of Counter-Strike ever. It doesn't count. No one counts what Gambit did, I'm sorry. Heroic, we count what you did on LAN. Props to what you did on LAN. No one gives a fuck online, mate. Sorry to, like, evil geniuses who had, like, a mini era online. It doesn't matter. No one gives a shit. You were beating Gen G, et cetera, and people who were, like, were about to retire and get kicked off team. Like, no one gives a shit about that. I'm sorry, they don't. Like, I know at the time we had to sort of, like, fucking WWE kayfabe the shit like ah oh, it, it counts like and then the second we all got back to LAN why was everyone just like LAN LAN like we're on LAN now ladies and gentlemen LAN is back in the building like because we were just so grateful like sorry the online era doesn't count so as a result I'm sorry that's what fucking sucks for Zewu because he was bonkers in the online era but he's only played for three and a half like real years at tier one and one and a half was online so when you make it that he's had two years like Moses says 
Mate, you can take his best two years. I can take, like, the middle two years of Simple's career. It's comparable. And then, unfortunately, you're always loving to bang on Simple and Nico in those fucking major finals, Maui, and the big, oh, they blew this fight. Brother, you don't even want to open the prestige tournament <laughs> composition for your boy Zewu. Like, it's like a fucking, there's four pages in it, and they don't, there's all, at the end of the story, the kids all die, the witch cooks them in the oven, the fucking big bad wolf eats the grandma. It never ends well. It never ends well, mate. It ended well this time because he was playing. Playing, checks notes game allegiance right that's the end of that story children uh, another story for another day and then i'll just say this Howie. go on go on save this point for next time when you bring maniac on the podcast yeah exactly you need, you need yeah. maniac to back you up on this would, one. okay maniac. okay okay you need this the cavalry so for this one this point got a little bit sidetracked because it was also like the original thing that i wrote down which i i ended up going on the tangent with the number one number two discussion but it's more like you look at simple's career and you actually just wish it were more than one major really like that, oh, that sure, is yeah. like, like a for simple's sure. career was disappointing it, it slightly opens the door for the number one, number two conversation. But more more than anything, it's just almost like, why why was the best player of all time in CSGO not accomplishing more on the grandest of stages? And yeah, to, okay. to only win the single major, yeah, he had a couple major final appearances, which were incredi incredibly impressive. Like you said, with the kind of limping Navi to get them to, to one finals, okay. and then also to do it with Liquid as well. Like, that's where it's incredibly impressive. Sure. But to just see the all-time greatest of this game only have the single one world championship is where it's just almost depressing. Put it this way, I'll do that. I'll give you this take, right? Because I do I want to address that original point that you were making there. Essentially, how did it end for the, the majors for CSGO, right? In simple. I have a point on another show me and Maui did where I just say that the reason why the whole Dupree winning his fifth major angle doesn't work if you want to put him up like the greatest players list is because if someone said to you when you're a big Dupree fan, oh, I've just started in CS2. I've heard this Dupree guy won the most majors. So let me go and check how good he is. I'll just go and look at the last major he played. As a Dupree fan, you'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, you know what? Maybe skip that one and go back. Go back to like 27 because you know it wouldn't look good, would it? The player would go, what the fuck? This is the guy with the five. So that's why you know you don't really believe the fifth one counts. So what I'll say is this. Yes, if someone in CS2 goes, I've heard this simple guy was the goat and was even the best player till 2022. Let me boot up the last major he played and let me see how good he is. You'd obviously say like, well, no, like th that's actually probably the worst one to watch. Like it ended really badly. He shit the bed. Like there's all the angles. Like I I'm with you on that. I think you've got a good point there. And you look at the way he lost. Mate, there's, there's, there's three angles to this. One plays in his favour, two play massively against. One is the Warrow 2K angle. Which, listen, World 2K's trash talk was shit. If I can rewrite the script, I'll make it way better. Because his trash talk was like, oh, yeah... Well, you know what? I will trash you one day. Yeah, sure, you might beat me. And, and you know, it might come in the future one day. And, you know, like on a blue moon or Tuesday. But I will beat you one day. So not even like, he didn't even say like, I'll beat you for a championship. Like, I'll win the tournament. Like, I'll be the best I'll player. I'll see you at the major, yeah, motherfucker. He, he didn't even say like, you know, the next time, exactly. I'll beat your bitch ass now with my player. He didn't say any of that. What he basically did was like, go like, yeah, well, one day I'll win. Starting now. No, sorry, uh, that doesn't count. Wait, you, you get that one. Okay, you can win that one. Starting now. Shit, wait. <laughs> now, like, you can't do that. Like, everyone knows that's bullshit. So the war took... But at the same time, you did literally essentially tell this guy, like, hey, punk, learn the game. And then he did basically put you, like, on the brink of elimination. You did get eliminated next round at a major. That sucks for you. Then secondly, this might seem like a minor thing. I'm going to let everyone behind the, the curtain of the WWE fucking you know, that like the stage and let you actually know why I did this. Cause y'all are all going to think, cause I have my beef with simple that I just did that tweet at him. Like you're just going to let them take the major from you just to fuck with him. Right. I actually did that. I've only done that twice in the history of counter-strike where I called someone out and tagged them all. The other time was when after they failed that Berlin major, there was a tournament. I can't remember if it was ESL New York or ECS. I did it to the team liquid players. I tagged them all and just basically said when they were going in like a semi against Astralis, I just said like, you're just going to let them beat you every fucking time basically like is this it is this it do you not have any do you know basically do you not have any balls you're not ever going to turn up to one of these matches and show them that you're as good and in both cases by the way both people lost but i'll tell you what if you actually watched that one they weren't even that bad that was even a close series the reason i did that was low key hoping he actually would fucking wake up and that you know what not only win the fucking game to go through the major dickhead why not try and prove me wrong just show me you are still the goat like just have one big game win or lose where you just pop off because there's another thing you could have lost but been sick 
If you'd have lost him yeah. being awesome, yeah. The way he played on, like everyone knows, the way he played that Anubis map at the end against FaZe, he was one of the reasons they lost. He was like pushing all the time. He bought non-stop, by the way. He did rage buys. And then also, he just whiffed every fucking first op shot. That ain't simple. If you've seen Simple's career, I could show you seven years where he always hits the first shot, where even if he buys a stupid glass cannon, he gets two kills with it. Like, that was the most whack way to go out. And then the one point I say plays in his favour is this. It's only an asterisk. The results all still count, mate. That's the way your career works. But I will give you an asterisk. You cannot go home to your home country and have not for like over one year now. That is something that every player who isn't Ukrainian is not experiencing. So I'll give you that one asterisk that if someone somehow said, why did his game go off the boil? That, I'd have to mention that. That is something I'd mention because I know the devices of the world. It's why actually I've heard Jacob's in Apex. Apex is a Norwegian org. He could have been in other teams. He could have been in NA teams again. But I've heard the reason why is he's sick of traveling. He's sick of being in America with all the Australians. He wanted to be at home in Norway. That is the beauty, by the way, of our game CSGO. Unlike League of Legends, you don't have to live in Germany all the time or live in LA all the time. If you actually a device, you can be like the winning all the tournaments and go home and see your family and be with the people in Denmark. If you're fucking Zewu now, you can go back to France, see your mum, see your family, have some that's one of the best features, and he has denied that right now. So that, as I say, it doesn't excuse the results, but it's a slight asterisk. But I think it definitely sucks. Like as I said, and also by the way, this was the best player ever at the majors. Even early on, he was mega. Even on the bad teams like Moses said, he was mega. So the idea of the last one is like, that's the one that sucked the most. Yeah, that is a bummer. Like, I, like I'm going to have to say to the fans myself, don't check out that last one. Check any of the other ones you want out. I'm cool with that. But please don't look at that last one. Like, we sort of swept that one on the rug, guys. <laughs> Actually, I mean, if you ever if you ever wanted to make the argument in the battle for like who's the greatest in CS:GO, I think Device is the one the closest that you could make the it's most interesting, points right? To actually contend yeah. against Simple, I think like if we wanted to go down that road at some point, it's actually it's actually mind boggling to me how few times his name comes That's up bad, in that conversation it? of the Simple yep. versus I Woo, and I'm just standing there, I'm like. Y'all forget about my boy device. Yep. Like four fucking majors. Yep. One of the like one of the boys. And I think I think it comes down to playstyle. I think it's just because as an opera, yes. he's not a sexy playstyle to watch. So like people just kind of forget that he how dominant he was and how much of a force he was. I think that's the closest conversation to taking away goat status. And I think I could I think I would have a lot of fun making that making that argument oh, sure. of saying device is the goat over simple. I mean, one, I will say, Alan, I think Alan Hedder actually does have him as the goal, or Hawk, or one of the two actually does think he's the sure. goal for that reason, and then two... I think if I, I think if I was asked to give a vote, I would probably I would probably give it to Device, to be honest with you. I, I definitely think, agree I on the play style, by the way, because the other thing is, I actually think the parallel right now is just that Jokic guy in the NBA. People want him not to be the MVP and not win, just because they're like, is this barring? Like, that's not, yeah. that, not shooting three-pointers. It's like, the game's about more than that, though, isn't it? And I'll also I mean, say as well... This is why, though, I have to... Well, I we'll always agree with us. It is simple by a large margin if you just watch the game. And the reason I have to say that is, spoiler, I currently don't fucking like the guy. Meanwhile, I spent also an equal amount of time building the narrative, like, device would be really good. You think I wouldn't just love to rub it in Yanko's face all day long? Like, remember <laughs> how you said that my boy Devi was a fucking choker? Four of these motherfuckers, homie. I'm like John Cena in this bitch, and <laughs> Nico can't even come see me. I'd love to do that, but I can't do it in good faith. Like, simple just... It just was goated if I just watch it, like... I think, I've said this before. If people don't know, when that Snipe to Die channel makes those, like, you know, like, if you come, like, top one, you get, like, a 20-minute video. They did a video. You can look this up. It was in 20... 19, I think. It wasn't even recently. They did a simple video that's like his career to 2019. It's two and a half hours long and there's no filler. There's no filler. The t it's fucking longer than like an actual movie. And there's no filler. they're all just decal 3Ks with a 1v5. Like it's actually, the joke is I wanted to watch it and go, they fucking sex this up. And I, I got 10 minutes in, I was like, the fuck this this should actually <laughs> so is this whole career just gonna be a 10 hour frank movie like what is this shit like remember normal humans just like even really good players like have like a fucking 30 minute frank movie for the whole career the whole and even then you know you got some average kills in there this is it's just busted it is but anyway it's the way i actually did the opposite there those that was a bad point about simple at the end i just waxed lyrical about 10 minutes while i'm fucking sick he is <laughs> now he's definitely yeah, goated videos. yeah there you go watch that frag movie right now it's time for my bad point uh -oh. And this is actually a weird one because it'll sound counterintuitive. But because I actually, look, the major itself didn't really try to celebrate the idea it was the last CSGO major. That was almost like a side topic or a narrative on the desk and in casters. There wasn't really that much in the actual event that did that idea. Like, they didn't, like, bring out all the major winners or any, they didn't really do any of that stuff. They didn't really have, like, whole things of the great moments and stuff. Like, they just lightly touched on it. The problem is, 
We could have had such a sick way to make the major like that if it was the last tournament in CSGO. The fact that it's like, if you're a fan, I know a lot of fans kept conflating this. They kept thinking it is the end of CSGO and going like, oh, well, what a way to send them off. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, not only is there IM Dallas, there's Cologne. And in fact, if you look at when the open beta thing is, which is now sort of being pushed back, I'm hearing behind the scenes, it's not going to be like in the summer or whatever. It sounds like it might even be, maybe the it's CSGO till the end of the year or like October or something crazy. Australian summer. Yeah, so as a result, if you do that, that, that does sort of like wreck our whole narrative because it's like, well, that's the end of CSGO majors. What, what, why did you why did you go quiet on that? So majors, like, just <laughs> just say it out loud. Oh, sorry, mate. So there's actually like about seven more tournaments. Like, what are we doing here? So even though, look, I want tournaments. We, it's the same story of why we all asked like for majors to be the last tournament before the player break. You just scoff the narrative a bit, don't you? Because like, this is going to be the same thing with this Dallas as that last one. I made the joke that to keep it on point, the winner of Dallas should again be Cloud Nine, just to show that like, well, you know, majors mean everything these tournaments are sort of stupid if you hold them a week afterwards half the teams drop out not knowing if they're going to win the major if they lose the major like it, it essentially you just scuffed the circuit i wish there was like a logic to the circuit for me basically i want to build into the big prestige events yeah we have it we have it organized very strangely and i, I, I like i mean there's no way to have like a proper solution without without valve stepping in and being basically. more hands-on with with the organization but i i agree with you that was i was actually as a commentator that was like the hardest the hardest thing i had to like cast was like that kind of narrative we were taking in and, and i don't really buy into it as like the end of, of counter-strike or csgo so to speak but like you could tell that that was hitting the players you could tell to the yeah. players they very much felt that like yeah. the last csgo major was something significant which is why i tried to hit that angle but like when i was casting phase the phase navi elimination game and it was either kerrigan or simple going out that was like such a hard like emotion to like actually hit and then knowing that there were still at least two more events of CSGO coming after the fact as well so like having to add the qualifier of the major at the end of it was really fucking painful but also just a very hard target to hit like emotionally when it comes to like storytelling yes. to me the other events do matter but they just matter less by a significant enough margin that I was signing off most of my <coughs> statements with this being a f there, like the, the game's history being finite and that finitude was in ways defining people's careers like I wasn't going to hold back on how I see Kadian as a leader because he's not accomplished anything well you know he's playoffs but like he's never won the biggest trophy which is a major yeah. trophy so like that's why i know where i'm gonna rank him in my hierarchy even if he does win dallas and he wins the the spring finals and he wins cologne i will okay i'll say this if he wins all three of those back to back to back it will change a little bit of how i feel about him but i'm not gonna No, but even then maui here's the reason it'd suck let's say that let's say g2 or heroic won every single tournament now let's say there was five yeah wouldn't it suck that there was no major at the end and then we switch games like in a way it yes. ruined their narrative too if you know what i mean yeah yeah it's it's almost kind of like like think of what kind of run like what like it's gonna be i'll say this so the weirder thing is gonna be what how do we count the grand slam like is the grand slam coming up knows? are we gonna include uh dallas and then cologne and then we switch to cs2 and it's like the first ever grand slam won with two games in csgo and two games in cs2 like that's not gonna mean that that's gonna ruin a lot of narratives actually i'm not i'm not ready to accept like heroic or grand slam winners of cs2 the first it's like well, half their games were in CSGO, you know, unless they do it all in the second game, but or the new one. But yeah, it just, it just makes things super clunky. And I think that's where it's just really off-putting because if you're trying to follow this game as a slightly more casual fan, like it, it's getting worse and worse in terms of that we're catering only to hardcore fans in this space. Like you have to follow the circuit so closely to actually understand the legacy points that we're adding and deducting from every single person's career. Whereas... In other sports, like, again, it's like other sports, it's so much easier because you have the season, you have the ch world championship, even Dota, for that matter, is actually easier, even though I wouldn't want sure. there to be the singular singular TI championship. I know what I think of Seb's career and the redemption arc that it, that it was, uh, that underwent, that it underwent. So, yes. um... Yeah, with, with, with CS, like, it just, it's just, we're not doing ourselves any favors in, in terms of story building by any means. I will say, the best example yeah. is, if you already watch the majors, you actually think Cloud9 just sucks. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think they're, they're the you worst? Th you just think they're really bad? Like, you don't actually yeah. know that, like, if there's no pressure, they're fucking unbelievable. And, good. Antwerp, yeah. Antwerp, the way they clo they choke to Imperial, the yeah. way at Rio you lose to Maus, and then you don't even qualify no, for the you, next one. You think, they just you think this is one of the worst? Like, yeah. you'd be like, why did they fluke getting into the Rio playoffs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These yeah, analysts are all idiots. Why do they hype them up? Um, <laughs> the season five of the Intel Grand Slam has already begun. Vitality have one win, nine more chances for winning Rio. Oh god, nine more. You know what that means? So that nine, means it yeah, nine more. It's going to be nine more. It's going to be. It's going to be CS two. It's going to be CS two. It is what it is. All right. Shout out. All right. Intel. Listen, listen. That that sucks in a way. But I'm just saying, you've already Carmack built in that when Zero wins the Grand Slam, I go wasn't even all in CS two, was it? So <laughs> can't even win his bloody Grand Slams in the same way. I, I hit. I hit away. I tell you, I told Moz on this certain other show. I told him. I hate in a way that I am Skip Bayless and Zewu is my LeBron, but I also love it because I also think Skip Bayless has some good points about LeBron. So suck on that. Exactly. Oh, you're the Skip Bayless. Yeah, I am. Thank you. That's the yes meme, you motherfuckers. I've got you all nailed. Yes, I've got you. Right, go on then. It's your time for your ugly point now, Moses. And by the way, I could like even have predicted this with like a mad lips of what would Moses' ugly point be after this major, but hit me with it anyway. Get ready. I'm already like, I'm ready for the fucking classic fucking shit. I've got Linkin Park in the end of my earphones. You know, <laughs> I've got a fucking balls energy drink and I'm just ready. Like, hit me. What could Moses complain about the major? Oh my God. Any team's performance be? What would it be, what Moses? A, what a great preface. Come on. <laughs> okay. Well, my ugly point is... Team Liquid. My God. Sneaky <laughs> hidden <laughs> ball, nightmare. The balls in Lincoln Park. <laughs> there you go. It's classic. It's end, classic. It exactly. Classic. No, but I mean, if you look at the situation Liquid is in, this has been like a, a ticking time bomb. And I think at this point, it's kind of exploding, especially with, with CS2 coming out. Um, I mean, one, I think it's, I mentioned this the other day on Talking Counter as well with Duncan, where it's just, it's mental to me that like Liquid's like devastating loss in the quarterfinals just kind of got swept under the rug. And I think that, that the biggest implication there is that Everyone expects them to like be disappointing in some kind of a big game. Like nobody, nobody truly believes them. And that loss of faith is a turning point in my mind for Team Liquid because there's always at least been like a hopeful vantage point for the outside for Team Liquid. But the bigger point I want to make with my with this ugly section is just look at what's happening with this team now. Like, first of all, you have to have sweeping changes, right? Like Nitro can't stay if he's not the in-game leader. And even if he does stay to be the in-game leader, hasn't even necessarily shown that he can do that particularly well. I'm not trying to drag on him, but Nitro throughout his career career started as an entry fragger he was supposed to become a star player at one point early on in his career way way back in the day in like 2015 he became an opper he became an in-game leader and he's been able to do all those things relatively effectively but the idea that now in his career with a second child just being born right before the major he's going to be able to once again reinvent the wheel it's crazy to me so like in my mind he, he has to be moving out the team has shown no ability even when i was there as the coach some of it falls on me as well to develop properly and effectively young and new talent coming out of North America. I think part of it falls on the players not being overly accepting and not being able to be willing to do that kind of hard work to bring them up. But for whatever reason, new talent has a real hard time kind of fighting their place within Team Liquid. I think OC's gone through that struggle as well. He stepped out of it a little bit at the major, but not super convincingly. Um, you have a world where NAF has been openly saying in interviews he's, he's interested in playing in Europe in the future for a European team. So you have your best player of the year openly saying he's he's you know in the back of his mind he wants to go over to Europe at some point and if you want to go a crazy route a full European squad is interesting if you move NAF over there and you have your kinder and you build you build out around those two players especially considering the North American region is so busted and beat up however then you lose the easy qualification spot especially to the major through the Americas qualifier which is a cakewalk compared to Europe um, and and you obviously lose that you know your your America standings in like the ESL the Louvre agreement you lose it with other qualifications other tournaments I think you look at another one. Elijah has been the center point and the star player and the franchise player for this team for what going on eight years now and hasn't been able to bring the big one home. And even like outside of that, like they haven't truly been competitive for long stretches. It's been like quick spurts. Like their 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 grand slam run was 64 days. But outside of that, in 2019, they weren't nearly reaching their potential. 2018 was probably in some ways. In some ways, the best year to more consistent start year to finish. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the year that they've had with all those second places. But even more than anything, team does like what's the identity of Team Liquid and like what, what's the soul of this team? And when have you ever felt that they've come together as a squad? They still struggle like starting in events. They still struggle like with breaks coming into a new event, coming in between stages and coming out playing like they were when they left off. And so, I mean, I think this team is just in in a state now where 
if you're the organization, if you're like the owner, if you're the manager of Team Liquid, you've got some real soul searching to do because this team might just have to be blown up and look towards a rebuild going into CS2 and going into the latter stage or the final stages of CSGO. With, with Elige to kick that off is that your franchise player for the last four majors has yet to post up a above 1.0 kill death ratio. He's not a star player anymore. Elige is far past that and the reason that i would almost believe that his stats are as good as they are is because he uh now and then just gets to farm domestic competition it's like every time it feels like like a katavitsa he was kind of just whelming he was just all right at katavitsa it's kind of the same performance at eso pro league uh the i mean rio major i like i already said like not really doing that well at the most recent major not that well either like you, I, I, I like the point that you made. We're just putting Naf and Yakindar on a European squad because I don't really see how any of the other people are that valuable anymore. When you have such a wealth of opera talent in Europe as it stands, like, like look at look at what OG did. Dexter's taking yeah. a little bit of a sit back. They're getting Regali, who was on everybody's radar in the tier two space for such a long time, and it looks like he's delivering. So maybe even just poach Dexter if he's going to be out, or just get Regali if OG don't actually pull the trigger on him, or get one of these Eastern European operas that we also know are so good. And because everybody can speak English to varying degrees, but more or less competently, then just bring them onto the on board because you Kinder's obviously the one that's that's calling in these situations. And on top of that, if you have your kinder calling as an in-game leader and you're going to bring an Eastern European player who's not as comfortable speaking English, guess what? Your kinder can speak Russian. He can actually mold one of those players and also bring them along, help them out as they're getting their, I guess, English sea legs underneath them. So I think that would be a great idea. And then uh, by, by then, you just pick a couple riflers. Give me Ema. Give me, give me someone from Apex even. Yeah, but just... now you're not an American team anymore. You've yes, walked into but... the fucking trap, Maui. But I, I think I think that is such that should to me almost should be such a side quest little goal. Like if you're not making if you're making these upgrades like we're talking about and you're not making the major, well, something else is just fundamentally going wrong or you're just very, very unlucky. And I think Cloud9. Well, I don't think they're unlucky. I think they have a bad captain. But I also think that with with Liquid, <laughs> with that kind of team, you would not be unlucky because you have a decent captain. You have great players. You would make it to the major. And so that that whole american angle is almost like the one thing that I, and i don't even know the numbers on it is just that you would you would lose some of your american fan base like it's still when i talk to my friends who are cat more casual fans of csgo they are still liquid fans and they're still in some ways complexity fans because they know that they can identify with those people just because they're from our region <clears throat> but i also don't think that that's that that's i don't i mean again only, i don't know the numbers it, the biggest reason I would say that isn't necessarily even for the fan base, although there, there's there's that consideration for sure. It's just for the major. I mean, you have to think too, like that's what, like, I mean, I don't know how much sticker money necessarily is amongst all teams, but let's just say oh, five hundred thousand dollars a yeah, year for being surely. at two majors. Like that's a shit ton of money to just be like, oh, let's let's roll the dice. This will now be a gamble. This half million dollars a year, yes, which is which I don't think. I mean, I wouldn't make that gamble. I fucking not when you have not when you have Fluxo qualifying through the Americas. I'm going to that Americas qualifier all day. I think what I would actually do if I'm liquid if I, if I was in charge i keep naf i keep you kinder and i even keep oc and i say oc if you want to stay on this team we're moving to europe like and i'm just playing out of the utrecht facility your kinder gets to stay at home naf wants to move to europe you put you put oc out in utrecht you get in an apartment there he gets to chill you have the facility you pick up one more european player and you find one more american who wants to roll the dice and take a risk and move to europe and see how things go for the next year the real problem is, like you say, if you add in the condition that you've got to keep three NA players, you're just going to end up with one disappointing player that you're keeping in some context. Like, for example, I don't think Nitro is a terrible caller, but I do think it said a lot that in that segment, for, I think it was Blast, everyone even said they liked him as a caller, but that he was the most predictable. Like, I think it was, e I think it was ESL Caddo. There you go, ESL. Yeah. The reason why that is so terrible is because here's the difference, right? If you look at, like, results, like, Ence's results are somewhat comparable to some of the Liquid results. People would tell you, Snappy's an underrated caller. Actually, he's a pretty good. Look what he's doing with the pieces he has. And he's sometimes yeah. bringing some smokes and some things on T-side on this map. No one's saying that about Nitro, so that kills me. So if I have to keep Nitro as, like, my guy, like, 
to replace OC and get like wonderful or some CIS or, but like, okay, we can do it, but we're still probably not winning the major. You know what I mean? We're still going to have one disappointing point. But I agree. The problem is business considerations in CSGO. We're not like some of the other games in terms of the revenue you get back. So I will say as well as the idea, you just make the major through the America's one. It is, it's an old school point, but it still does matter. When you go to sponsors, if you're just not at the world championship, <laughs> that's a hard yeah. sell. It doesn't matter how good you are outside of that. So if you ever fucked up one if you ever did a Cloud9 and fucked up the EURMR, it almost wouldn't matter that you were like, if you were the third best team in the world at that point in time. Like the sponsor, he's not watching the matches. He's just hearing like, but you didn't even make it to the major. Like, why am I sponsoring you? And also then, I will say, this is a less big point, but I imagine it is quite, I'd actually, I might even hit Jack up about this. I wonder how he does sell sponsors in the America's region, knowing all five players are from fucking Eastern Europe and not a single one's NA in Cloud9. Like, that's probably not that that great, quite frankly. I'm sure they can make it work if he says, look, I get better results or something, but it ain't, it ain't great. Like, you know what I mean? As bad as Nitro might be, he is still someone that people know the name of. He has the Captain America, you know what I mean? He has yeah. certain aspects outside of the server that work, right? I feel like I feel like even I mean just to that point on Cloud Nine I feel like there's there's so many obstacles to selling sponsors in Counter Strike in North America before you even get to the fact that the yes. team is Russian. Like most sponsors in NA are like, yeah, we'll happily do it, but you can't ever show guns in any of the content. Like you can't show Counter Strike content with our name attached right. to it, which is yeah. just like weird in and of itself. Like you have plenty of obstacles there. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, there's there's so many there's so many tough things at the moment to, to be a North American based team. That's why it's like, I think you could find a way to do it. If you, if you got the right people, like, again, like, man, I don't know how high you guys are on like Suhei after this, but like, why not roll the dice on an in-game leader like him, bring yeah. him in. You have your kinder, get your kinder off the in-game leader rolls. You have NAF, who's a fantastic piece and you have OC as an opper, give him six months, see how he does, see if it's going to work. And then you pick up some stud rifler from NA who's like you, potential. And you see if you can build him into something. Maybe go back to Grim. Maybe Fang if you're feeling high on him. I'm not particularly like going down that route, but like there's some riflers out there you could grab. Then you just say, let's see what you got. Let's see what happens. My big problem if I'm like fixing the team, even if I ignore the NA component is, right now, it's as you say, the only two players you would take is Nafi and Yikinda. That's it. They're the only obvious picks. There's no wrong answer with those yeah. two. The problem with the Elise one is this. I would just say it straight up. I would just basically tell Elise, right, look, you actually did get, like Maui says, the last couple of years, essentially on the fucking company credit card because of what you did in the past and you were the franchise player. And you know what? In the online area, you actually carried us when we were bad. Fair play. You were only employee who could turn up and make up for some of the others. But right now, we only want you in, in, in Team Liquid if you are a star player. Like You are not here to do the pre roll and just like cruise and become less and less and less relevant. And then maybe if we win down the line, it's like, oh, we still got a leash though. Like that doesn't work for this team because we got all these flaws. Because the main problem they have in Liquid is this. If a leash was actually even, he doesn't even have to be that good. If he was basically just like, if he was as good as Magus is, you could maybe make it work. But even then, you're running a hard route because think about it, your two weakest players relative to their role at the top international level where you're going to have to play a semi-finals is Orp and IGL. People would argue they're probably the two most important roles in the game. Like, if you give someone a yeah. dominant Orp and a dominant IGL, mate, I can make a lot of things happen with other riflers. I can have a player be messing around. But if, if, we're, if we're weak at both those positions and then it's just, let's be real, our clutch player and the entry player that are the best. Like, I don't think anyone's ever won Counter-Strike player like that i mean that's why i always did think the 2019 grand slam run was epic because also like they're they didn't have the best igl and he was the opera it's like holy fuck you doing this on hard mode mate like all the other teams in yeah, history come with carrigan glaive or they have kenny s or guardian like you're just trying to do it off pure rifles like god bless you almost did it but almost isn't good enough as moses taught me except in hand grenades and horseshoes there you perfect go. nailed it you fucking nailed great. that line exactly <laughs> so there you go right come on then what's your Ugly point, Maui. Because luckily you couldn't pick Team Liquid because obviously all that's all, he's talking your mantle in that sense. He's doing the edgy takes of Thorin and he's doing the like, what you do is this before they're out of the tournament, you're like, come on, give Team Liquid a chance. They deserve more respect, guys. And also, this player's playing well and isn't naff good. And then when they lose, you just go, right, listen, I'm not fucking risking my reputation for you motherfuckers. <laughs> so you go to the desk and you're like, you are disgraced to North American Counter Strike. You have to cut off the team. Just get, exactly, get, 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 your, get Europeans in it. Get fucking Europeans in it right now. So come on. What is your actual ugly tip? It's not a Team Liquid think, one, thankfully. I think my desk segment more or less adhered it to was. that. It was. <laughs> it was yeah, more or less. Yeah, okay, okay. So my, mine is that... 
the ugly point, I actually think I brought this exact same point up at the last major, was that there's really no like regular discernible difference between tier one and tier two teams and players in terms of results. It's not just like you could look at style, you could look at the eye test for why Zaiwu pops off the page and everything like that. But you look at how these teams did at this major and it felt like surely the underdogs are going to fall. Surely like they're, it's going to stop. There's going to be an end to the madness that phase Navi, everybody's going to rise up and just defeat all these tier two ciphers. And they're just going to actually, you know, place where they where we think they should but actually it's ugly just that it almost feels like tier two or tier one partner teams their play style has been insulated for such a long time and that, that they think that their brand their brand of counter-strike is the right brand but it's so prone to being upset by these higher variant styles from tier two teams and i think that some of the tier two teams play good styles um, like Apex for the for that matter, I think they had one of the best tactical styles of the entire event. But I think that you look at an into the breach, and it's just like there's no like this this point this point has a couple different components to it. One is that the results say it's random. The second is that there's no obvious right way to play Counter Strike, and it almost feels like playing random CS is just is just fine. Like you're you're okay with that because you can give yourself these weird tournament runs like like into the breach did. Yeah, I think I think at the moment, the way I look at it kind of at the moment with like the tier two and the tier one teams and, and I think the gap closing, because I think I know there's been there's been a large push for saying this is a weak era for the top of Counter-Strike. And I, I guess there's some truth to that, but I, I think that's like kind of, I don't know, I think that's kind of like a, a one dimensional angle to it. Because I think I think if you look at the meta at the moment, there's there's so much more leeway and emphasis on individuals to being able to to make to make plays i think individuals are able to activate themselves so much that i think that's probably a, a huge portion of what's kind of closing the gap in terms of tier two teams rising up and players being able to contend is look at how much freedom just individuals have to make a play relative to what it used to be based off like what's happening on the map like into like lurkers like you want to talk about offers and in-game leaders being uh being important right now i think lurkers are extremely important to where they haven't always been in the past um we're just attacking the extremity while attention is elsewhere and being able to make a decision to just have the freedom to go for when you feel like you have a 1v1 duel inside of a bomb site and i feel like there's like a very individualistic element in today's Counter-Strike within a team framework, which it almost reminds me of a lot of teams playing Duncan the way like old school and the old school like fanatic way where there was like a hive mind and you just kind of operated understanding what the goal is. But individually, you get so much freedom as long as you're working towards that same goal as your teammates on the other side of the map. And I think I think that I think for me, that's kind of what's closed the gap the most between tier two and tier one. And also, like, I think we have to remember, and I think a lot of people people don't fully understand this about Counter-Strike is individual skill and like mechanics and talent is like the easiest thing to, I'm not, I mean, it's not, it's not easy, but it is the easiest thing to match up against the tier one players with. Yes. I think so frequently tier two players can have similar <clears throat> skills to the best players in the world, but what you're missing is the game sense or the movement or the positional knowledge to put that skill to good use the way tier, tier one players have done in the past. Okay. Right, the problem I have with this is I sort of disagree in a way. Like, the problem I have is I think certain players skew this. Like, for example, you t let's take the Immer guy off Game Allegiant, and then Maui can go and pick anyone else from the equivalent tier 2 level and put them in Immer's spot. Does Game Allegiant do any of that? No. Like, you go look at that stat line for that major, those were like fucking Nico simple, like, <laughs> god numbers. Like, that was bonkers, that stat line he had for this tournament. Like, I think there's certain players, I'll give you that. What that taught me about this major, my first conclusion was, look at these players. Immer absolutely deserves to be on a good team. Should at least be given a crack to see if he's a really top player. Nork actually looks like he might be a good land player now. Like, we don't have to wonder, would he have made it if he'd have had a chance on Nipley? He actually looks like he can do it. Look pretty solid. The Cypher guy is completely out of nowhere. That is some, like, what the... Uh, this guy fucking exists in the UK scene. It's why the first thing I did was rush to his page and go, thank God he's 18. This isn't like the crucial one where it's probably a fruit clan and you played 10 years, you're not that good. You actually are 18 years old. Probably the thing is... He's you, 20, he's 20. But, 20 then, whatever. Like, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I think he just turned young. 20 then, but whatever. Yeah. Like, in that scenario, it's like, 
you actually just inexperienced. You actually haven't had the chance. And because you're from the UK, you probably even have the stigma against you. Like, they're all shit. And you're, aren't you all like that Thomas guy or whatever? So, or, and the best we had was bloody Smoo, who was a fucking nutcase. So, like, I, I can see the world where they're actually good players. The Boris guy at least has the aim. I agree with Moses. There's a lot more than that to aim. And to, you saw if all you have is aim, it'll only take you so far, mate. Like, you, you, you won't really do what Simple does because you posted Simple's numbers. You have to have the rest of Simple's game. I'd even say the GL guy had some series that looked pretty good. The point is, if you take a lot of these players and put them into the aforementioned bigger teams that lose, not the super teams, we're talking like the 7 to 12 sort of teams, some of these teams will be better. That They probably should get their call up now to the big leagues. But if you do that, most of those other teams immediately just fall away and you never hear the name again. They're not They're not going to be able to do an ends and just retool. With, what, they found another good rifle. That's, gonna, that's not going to happen to those teams, which suggests to me there isn't some crazy talent pool. In terms of teams, though, I'm sort of with you. The problem I have is the reason why why I always do side on the Richard side of things is I do have eyes. I'm not seeing into the breach frag out against FaZe and going, holy shit, FaZe is awesome. Look how good their players are playing. And they're losing into the breach. I'm also seeing FaZe players just shit the bed. Can't win any CT duels against a guy walking in the contact player with an AK. Like, that tells me FaZe has got serious fucking problems. When G2 loses, we didn't go, well, you know what? All the tier two teams are sick. G2 did play like they did at Kanavitsi and they just lost. We all watched and we went, what the fuck happened to Monacy CT side? Nico blew the last map and fucking, um, what's his name, Hooksy had some nightmare fucking games and looked like you'd shit the bed. You look at fucking Na'Vi. Did anyone see Na'Vi by a sliver get eliminated in the Swiss system and go, well, they're still a really a fucking amazing team. No, we watched them and we were like, God, they need to make so many, maybe Simple needs a break, kick the MPL guy, take electronic off IGL. Maybe we need to rethink bits because it... It was like, changed the whole thing. So I'll just make this quick point. The reason I listed a bunch of those teams off is, here's what I think's changed. You don't get to just immediately take those players from these teams like this, like he used to in the past years. There's too many agents, there's too many contracts, there's too many buyouts. And because you don't get to some of the lands, we don't see these players until suddenly they appear, right? Think of those teams I just mentioned. I'll even take the winners. Dude, Vitality would never have stuck it out with the original lineup with Masuta if it had, at that point, if they hadn't have spent so much money on the salaries of the new players and said, well, we have to chill out. And plus, you can't sign anyone you want. Suddenly, we got you the Spinks player. That wasn't enough. You still weren't at the top. People were still saying, I need one more change. It might be Kick Dupree. It might be Kick Apex. Back in the day, by the way, there's no, we need more, more change. You just make the change. It doesn't work for three months with Spinks. You go, all right, Spinks, either you change role or I'm kicking Dupree, basically. You just make the change immediately. Instead, you had to with Vitality stick it out for like nine months now and it just turned out at ten months and at the end Sonic f solved the problem with Apex and they figured out how to make Sphinx one G2 like, they've learned, because these buyouts are so expensive, motherfucker, we bought you Alexi B, and we got you Monacy. You didn't like that, so we changed out Alexi B, got you a different coach, got you Hoxie, got you JKS. Like, bro, we're not just giving you, like, 10 players a year. Figure it out. And you didn't. At the end, you didn't figure out the major, and you shit the bed. Na'Vi is the best example. NPL would never have lasted this many lands in the pre-COVID era. Like, he would have just been done after two. And the, the point is, one of these amazing CIS players we all see now, they would have just walked in the door. And immediately, you'd hit the ground running again. You'd be back. Everyone would be hyped as fuck about Na'Vi. The problem is, like, all these top teams, you notice, they also have other reasons why they can't just take the talent like they used to. Now they actually have to sometimes figure the lineup out. If you Essentially, if you make your bed and it's shit... You just have to sleep in the shitty bed for a year now. It fucking sucks. It means if you're the people like the Nikos and Simples, that's why you're losing your mind. Because it's like the old days, you could just use star power and sit like Simple and Nico could have gotten people fired. Maybe they have. Like that in the past. Even decent players, they just went, look, I just don't like him. He doesn't vibe with me. Change him out for someone else. So I also think CS is just so different because of business now as well. If people don't realize, the reason why I'm a bit, I bristle a little bit against the whole, like, let's just get rid of all the partner leagues is like, the reason we did the partner leagues is because everyone said I'm losing money out the arse running CS Go. And let's be real, we learned this in Flashpoint. I'll just straight up leave if you don't give me more revenue. If you don't give me a way to make it up, like I have in Rocket League and Rainbow Six with skins or in fucking in League of Legends an hour with like a spot I'm just leaving and I'm going to Valorant or I'm going to some other game so unfortunately that was like the deal with the devil we made where we had to say to evil geniuses that we didn't know at the time even if your team totally sucks you're in the part league almost forever 
that's unfortunately the, almost the deal we made with the devil. So as a purist, I hate it. I would have a totally open circuit in a way like the old days. But I also know that like the businessmen would just tell me, well, then you're not going to have the same salaries. You're not going to have the same league. Quite frankly, a bunch of teams might leave and you might be a smaller game. So I think that's why that's why I think it's good ugly point. I don't think it's good or bad. I think it has, it has elements for certain people. Like it's good for the tier two people when they come up, like you said. It's bad for some of the big orgs that can't change players. It's just ugly. It's actually a good, it's a good one, Maui. It's a good one, mate. Yeah, I have a question for you, Duncan. Because you used to have you used to have that system in early CS:GO that you took back uh, from like I've, I'm assuming you got it from like 1.6, but like you used to have like that three month test. Like yes. if the team doesn't show you what their peak is in like three months, yep. it's like you know you know what they are. Yes, has that changed at all for you have you extended it to like five months now i haven't but i would say we probably should because for that reason because that basically the other reason the three month thing worked is if you ever go and look pick, i had a famous other rule which is even great teams tended to only last nine months even if they win everything because what happens is when you stop winning you have the three months that go badly you go right better change something get back on top because back then you know how it was like the famous thing about if you were like if think about like some of my mates like msl Bro, if you get, it's like Snappy now. If you, if a player gets too good, un, unlucky for you, you don't get to beat Astralis with them. Astralis just take him. And now he's their player. And then they go, right, get another one. And I'll be back for him in the year if you beat me as well. That's what used yeah. to suck about those guys. Daps as well. They used to just get the talent ticket. The funny thing now is, it's sort of better for that leader now. Like Snappy just gets to keep some of these players. They don't all just get taken tomorrow. Some of the players in fucking the Virtus Pro is probably an example. Like They'll just get to keep those players for another year. doesn't matter how they do. So I, I do think in some ways, like essentially calling a team dead, like Vitality proves it was Spinks. If you called them dead at the end of last year, you'd look like an idiot now. They just won two tournaments and the major. But that's also because like, there, isn't the, there isn't the option to change. So I don't think it'd be brutal to say them three months in, like kick him because like, you can't. We just spent 250 grand on him. Like I, I can't spend that again. Yeah, that's right. Here we go. My last one. You had to know it was coming, guys. You had to know it was coming. It's ugly. So remember, it's not bad totally, but it is fucking ugly. Which is when people like Maui earlier, when he was doing like the fucking full heel turn, fucking copium for Zewu, like, and maybe with the same number of majors as simple, maybe he's let go. <laughs> when he does that, all I'll do is this go, come with me to get to fucking Liquipedia, sir. And now let's open HLTV. We'll now cross reference the rankings of the teams he beat to win his major. Because let's be real, you have to know it. He played the lowest ranked teams ever <laughs> to win a major, right? Here's the problem when you then tell me, like, same number of majors are simple. Bro, if I could put Prime Simple into majors that have those teams, he is Michael Jordan. He's sitting on six or seven of them motherfuckers. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, the joke is no other great player in history had that sort of a run. Like, here's the sickest thing. I made this point in my Thorin's Thoughts video. The really sick thing is, because the circuit used to be so small back in the day, all the other GOAT-type players won their majors against each other. Like, if you were at fucking Kenny S, you had to play against Olaf Meister to win your major, and vice versa. If you were Guardian, you played awesome, but sorry, you played Kenny S, fucking Cold Zera, and then straight into fucking, who was the other one he played? And, well, I guess I'll joke and say Skadoodle, but whatever. That one, I guess that one doesn't count. That one, that one doesn't count as much, whatever. That one's just to fucking lay up for Skadoodle on that one. That's my point. All those other people, like Device, when we said he choked, yeah, he choked to, like, Fnatic, fucking, I don't know, Nip, like, envious. He wasn't choking, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, he wasn't, like, losing against some bombs. Like, if you'd have put him against the equivalent of Gamer Legion, I don't think he would have choked in the same way. So, unfortunately, essentially, it's just this. Vitality wins a major without facing any of the world's best teams in the playoffs. Like, that's just going to be ugly forever. I'm sorry, there's no way around it. Just ugly. Emmy. And avoiding the avoiding any top team in the best of three as well. Oh yeah, also that was Bo One Ants yep. was uh, was Bo yep. One, and then it was Monty into the Monty fucked us basically. If Navi had at least played them, at least have that. You're right. If you could have just played Navi in that one, and well, that's one win. That's one fucking one title. Well, no, I think I, I yeah, it's almost like uh, I forget what what team it was that like even just made it like top eight, but like which which one of them it was that that had this run but it was like how can you this this goes back to the conversation we had at the beginning about like the seating and, and the format and everything like that but how how can we realistically have a major where you make top eight in the world without playing like anyone in the top 10 and it's like the same kind of concept like how do you how do you win if you're not playing the other how do you have become a world champion if you're not and again it's it's no fault of vitalities it's just like this again the system is just like the seating part of this is just so broken that you shouldn't be able to get like top four at a major without playing a top 10 team in the world. That's like, it's like, it's, it's crazy to me.
Like just those numbers. Um, I think like there's been times where you're a top team and you make it to the playoffs and you didn't really play anybody that good. Um, like uh, I, I guess. That is in theory how exam? seeding works. To be fair, yeah, but okay. I'm yeah, just gonna, yeah. so just going to so put that out there, yeah. you know. Like, yeah. so yeah, you don't you don't always <laughs> have to do that, I guess. But but winning the whole thing is, is where wild. it's yeah. it's it, that's where it's weird. Like, yeah, if it were just making the playoffs, like the legend stage doesn't do a great job yeah, in terms of like ma matchup by matchup, actually putting you against the best competition always. Like, what is it even Navi themselves last last year to make it? Like, Navi in last year's major only beat a Bo one on Vitality. And then they beat B and E and Big. Like that's their that's their major run. Then they lost in the um, playoffs to Furia. Like I don't know that that run from Simple isn't something that we're going to speak of for years and years. It's like oh they made the playoffs. It's like yeah by beating two teams we frankly don't really care that much about um, on the world stage. I like Big a lot, but let's just be honest. Okay, so the the with with Vitality's run at this one, it's just one of those big glaring issues with context where the ring argument is so worthless uh for for a lot of reasons where you obviously want to win you obviously and like not winning should put you behind people that do win more whereas like that's why i can't as a general like, rule yeah yeah like like with with asterisks in terms of majors in terms of world championships you st like there's still it's it's like is there repeated su success beyond that or was that your one trophy lift because of an asterisk major and vitality's in this one it's hard for me to say there's an asterisk um you would you would look at championships of years past and like try to poke holes in their resume also in some ways good luck like, good luck doing but, it but it's but it's a lot harder, you know. It's definitely it's definitely not as easy as this one. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's not like people are getting injured or anything like that, that they're playing against. Like they're still. But it, um, where do I want to go with this? It's just more or less like the the idea that like it's just two, two completely different arguments when you say you can only beat who's in front of you and and their their run was not great. Like that, I think that's the big conversation point for me <clears throat> on this is that you can be of the opinion that you can you can only beat who's in front of you and you can have an easy run like that's two very viable arguments They're the same they can be the same thing yeah you can be the same person saying both things yeah uh, but people are too tribal and yep. they just want to take sides so quickly in these kinds of discussions that you sometimes have a trouble differentiating between the two and that's just where things devolve into like the shit flinging fest that twitter always becomes and the hltv forums where it's just devil walk two simple one <laughs> like you know it's just like the age old age old just memes Gloss. come out let's blame let's blame katie and heroic they they really ruined they did. The, the legitimacy of vitality's major win it's all their fault <laughs> more key, more key heroic and team liquid actually fucked vitality in the end just like yes. they had to die to do so but like at the end like you know they'd stuck a stick of dynamite in the back of vitality's pocket so it just doesn't matter that they won so no the problem is i agree here's the thing maui it's because if you look at history it just sucks this happens in the ufc by the way there's people who were the champion and they won four or five title fights but it's like they just were in the weakest era or there was all upsets in the contenders matches and so no one really gives a fuck about them that they won the title fights until you face some legit it actually just happened with that guy if people don't know that Aldo guy who uh, Aljo rather the one who just fought Henry Cejudo until he fought Henry Cejudo he don't just fought like okay people even though he'd won like two or three title fights and so people were saying he's a fraud champion he was a champion but he just didn't have the big names there's the one problem right also, I learned this a while ago, and but I don't give a fuck that anyone hears this. I learned it from Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States. You don't just come up with a good point or a good argument. It has to have some catchy slogan that just makes the point for you and is so hard to overcome. So I wouldn't say in this context, like, everyone will remember, because everyone will forget the teams, Maui. They'll know it was a shit major, but they won't really remember who went to the breach were. Probably won't even remember Apex. They might remember Game of Legion if Immer becomes a legend. That'll be the start of his career. But here's the line that if I say really makes that goat debate sound shit, right? This is the line. Zewu in the major playoffs has never won a series against a team ranked in the top 17 of HLTV.org. Case closed, Your Honor. Uh, can we go to lunch? Can we break already? Can the jury just make the call now? Like, I don't think the defense actually needs to make a case. Is there any witness to cross-examine? Surely the only witness is Zewu. <laughs> I, I, it's a hard I, line. It's hard line to argue against, mate. He's never won a series ever, any major against the top seventeen.
ranked team. So the, this is this is what's crazy though, because like I like I just looked up like the the runs of Xavi uh, and Stockholm and FaZe and Antwerp. Like even though I mean again, like this, this is the odd like, weaker opponent, but it's still good teams, you know. Yeah, like, I mean, FaZe had to beat Ents in a best of one, and then Bad News Eagles in a best of one, and they played Cloud9 in their location best of three. Like, that was their legend stage. And then for Navi, it was, they had to play Heroic in a best of one, Virtus Pro in a best of one, they qualified against NIP. Like, that that route that those two teams take in the legend stage is so much more intense. Like, those, they just stop to bottom. And I, like, I, again, it's, I, I don't know, I, I, it's not a, a stab at Zywoo or even Vitality. It's just like... I guess it's just because there were just so many fucking upsets of this major that they were like, lucky just... for real. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, they they just they like, were lucky and unlucky in different ways in the fucked up yeah. sense. I yeah. even think as well, like the other thing that I think sucks about that as well is, I, I I'll phrase it this way: I always thought this was the most legit way to do it. I actually aren't one of those people where I just want my favorite player to win so he wins. Like I always wanted. By the way, the way Simple won his major was perfect for me. I wanted him to win while fragging the fuck out. Because, like, it would, like, for example, if Elise somehow had won this major and Team Liquid was the fluke winner of the major, right? I wouldn't be able to then go, yeah, Maui, take that motherfucker. Like, I wouldn't even bother putting that in my case, would I? Like, if anything, I'd be like, we'd ignore the major. Like, you know what? I'd, in some fucked up sense, I'd rather my player fragged out and lost the game than fucking won on, like, a shit performance. And even Vitality, I can tell you on some level, they obviously like that they won, but I'm sure they do think it sucks they never got to play anyone historic and have, like, for example, they don't have that match when they won that's like, oh, remember that? And we thought we couldn't make it and the Roar had us against the walls and we're on their map pick. They don't have that story. They, like, the documentary would suck. If they did, you know, those NBA and NFL documentaries about the champion, they always have to have the match, don't they? When it's like, we were down in the fourth quarter and we looked around and who was going to kill? No, the thing, like, so anyway, there we were in the final. Game of Legion was up 10 5 on Nuke. Just ran it back on the CT half, won the final, didn't we? Um, cheers. Like, like, what? What's the story in that major? Like, the, the, the documentary would be so bad. It'd be so bad. 